Okay, welcome back. Just forgot my microphone. Um, we are in Genesis 12 for um, our Declaring the End from the Beginning, a look at Genesis. We are close to finishing up this study. Um, and then next, if you're wondering, um, we're going to be going into Philippians and Colossians. So, um, going into those books written by Paul. But today we're going to finish up. I wanted us, let's start actually by praying um, to the Lord. Lord, we ask God that um, your spirit would speak to us, that we would hear your word, God, and that um, we would be completely submitting to you and what you say and what you want um, as we are children of yours, Lord. We ask God this in your holy name. Amen. Um, so we are going to be looking at Noah today. We're finally at Noah. And we learned in the last session that the name Noah is actually Noach, or, um, is the word for rest and comfort in Hebrew. So we're going to, let's look at really quickly in Hebrews. Hebrews has this great chapter. It is um, named or nicknamed chapter 11 is called the Hall of Faith um, because it goes through this amazing and brilliant history of the Jewish people um, and the patriarchs, if you will, to God. So we're going to start and just see what it actually says about Noah. And it says, if you go to Hebrews eleven seven, it gives you a little summary, a very short summary of Noah's life. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes from faith. So we see this concept that Noah clearly uh, was a man of righteousness. Noah, meaning um, rest, took eight people. Eight in the, num in the Bible is always a number of new beginning. For instance, we see um, the time of man is 7,000 years because God says a day is to the Lord a thousand years, a thousand years to the Lord is a day. And we are waiting, if you will, um, for the eighth day, for the new beginning that comes at Revelation 22. But um, you see here for Noah, because he believed, he had no idea what would happen when he got into that ark and God shut the door. He had no idea um, what this judgment would truly look like. In the same way, I think that us today that are living in the season of waiting for the eighth day, we're waiting for the seventh day as well, the millennial reign. We don't know what tomorrow looks like. That can make people feel very unstable, very uncomfortable, and very afraid. And they look to things to quote unquote fix it. Um, the fix of the day in our culture is government. We are following exactly, if you read Bonhoeffer, um, what he was writing about Germany pre-World War II, saying we, they have exchanged God for government, believing that government can fix things. And we are in the same place today where we believe that our government should fix mankind. And the problem is what we're going to find, what we found um, every time we vote and go, and I'm not saying don't vote, I'm the spouse of an army soldier. I believe in it, but it won't fix mankind. Man is deceitful above all else. We're not good. And um, we can only look as Augustine did towards the kingdom of God. Um, even if we happen to be in a place where we feel like as Augustine did, Rome was falling down around him. He, he had to come to the point where he had to say, if Rome falls, it falls, but my kingdom is with the Lord. So as we look at Noah, we're going to realize that it's very prophetic for what is coming because the ark was a prophecy. It was a prototype, and we're going to look at that today. Quickly, though, I want you to go to Matthew 24 and see what Jesus himself says about Noah. Jesus, um, if you jump down, this is Matthew 24 is a very famous chapter where it, Jesus basically tells them what's coming. This is the destruction of the temple, signs of the end of the age, the abomination of desolation, which as we've discussed um, was odd because 
he's speaking to Jews and they would have been like the abomination of desolation already happened, right? That was with Antioch Epiphanes. But Jesus is saying it's coming because as we've said over and over, prophecy is not as uh, as we Westerners like to feel a simple um, cause and effect, right? Um, a word, a prediction, and then an outcome. That is not how the Bible actually views prophecy. Prophecy is viewed as a pattern. And when you see prophecy as a pattern, you realize the first time it digs in, like, for instance, the abomination of desolation, it happens a little bit, but not everything is in it. So you know it's coming back round. And by the time it comes and the Antichrist sits literally in the temple and the abomination of desolation happens for the final time, that all things will be fulfilled that was in the prophecy. So that's how we have to look at prophecy. He then goes on to show the coming of the man in this chapter and the lesson of the fig tree. Um, my uncle actually has a wonderful book called um, The Fig Leaves, and it's really about that concept. What are What is the lesson of the fig, of fig tree for in times? But we're going to get to verse 36 now. This is Matthew 24, 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the sun. That's him. While Jesus was on earth, he didn't know the time of the um, second coming. The day or the hour, sorry. But the father only at that point knew. For as we were in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept all away. So will be the coming of the man of the son of man. The two men will be in the field and one will be taken and left. Two women will be grinding at the mill and one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know the day or the coming of the Lord. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would have let his house not been let his house been broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So clearly here we have a um, reference to what we were talking about in the last session Um what Enoch represents, the herpazo, or um, in common language, we call it the rapture. When the church is translated, um, we see that Jesus says it's going to be like the days of Noah. Um, that is a heavy, um, it has, I guess I should tell you, it has lots of indications. When we go and we start asking, okay, let's look at Genesis 6. What was it like in the days of Noah? Um, and just so you know, the reason why we believe if you look in Revelation, Revelation chapter one through three are the seven letters to the church. Um, and then by chapter four, the church is no longer on earth. The church is at that point um, in heaven. And so something happens and you hear him tell John, come up here, right? Um, very similar to what we're going to see today in Genesis 7, 1, when God says it's time to come into the ark, right? It's time. And it's God that does that. So when we start in Genesis 6, I am going to focus this session on the ark and how it prophesies or parallels Christ um, and um, the church and the Jews all together, right? The Israel and the church um, you see in this. And so um, that's going to be this session. I don't think I will get into Genesis 6 um, verse 1 through 4 in this session. I will do that in a next the next session. Um, so we're going to start, we're going to skip this beginning se session and um, look more at specifically Noah and the ark. And then in the next session, we'll go into the, to the Nephilim and um, doing Genesis backwards. So right now, we're going to start with Noah. Um, let's look at several things. Noah's ark parallels Christ. It is a prototype for Christ's coming. You have, um, just to give us a reference point, let's start that Noah is the 10th generation from Adam. Remember, we went over that in chapter five, naming he is a witness, okay, unto God, what is going to happen here. 
um, we've got roughly, when you start Genesis 6, 1,656 years after the fall. Um, some people will say from creation. Um, I really believe that timeline begins in Genesis 3 at the end. And um, we've discussed that. So I'm going to say after the fall because I think that's when linear time begins. But also know that scholars say from creation. Okay. Um, just to have both of those out there. But there's your timeline um, when Genesis 6 happens. Um, by this point, Adam is dead, okay? Um, just to give you the idea, remember Adam has died um, when Lamech, when Noah's father was, what is it, around 65 years old, I think. I'm trying to remember that. Um, so Adam is gone. Methuselah, the one who was, um, his, his name means his death shall bring, right? Judgment shall bring at his death, um, dies supposedly this year. Now that information is not in our Bible, that's in Jewish text, but um, it supposedly he dies in this year. And we see an interesting beginning here. Uh, man is beginning to multiply on the face of the earth. The word began there is the same as it was in four. If you remember going over there, it's not a good thing. It means to profane, to defile, to pollute. So I think it's giving you a clue that things are not going well. But he says, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. That's verse three, six, three. So we get this at the very beginning. We get... Um, what traditionally has been taught that man now can't live past 120 years. Um, I would present to you that that is actually not about how long men live. Let me tell you why before you say, no, I was taught that in Sunday school. I think it still could be that, but there's a, a wee bit of a problem here. And let me tell you the problem. This is Noah, right? Being told that you're not going to live past 120 years. Well, at the time, Noah's 600 years old. He will live after the flood 350 more years, making him 950 years old when he dies. Um, let, let's just go to Shem. Shem is Noah's son. After this God has said this, he's 600 years old when he dies. Let's go to um, Arfax. Um, did I say his name right? Arfaxad? Arfaxad. Yeah, yeah, you know him, Arfa Axad. <laughs> so he will live to be 438 years. Shelah, um, his son, will be 433 years. Eber will live 464 years. Peleg will be 239. Keep going, going, going. Nahor, 148. Terah, which is Abram's father, 205 years. You can find that in Genesis 11. Um, Abram will live 175 years. Isaac, 180 years. Jacob, 147 years. Um, they actually don't live under that timeline until Joseph at 110, who will end the book of Genesis, by the way. Um, if you're a dates person and you like to have dates, um, I wrote at the end of my, my book of Genesis so that I can keep everything straight. The end of the book of Genesis is 713 years after the deluge, okay, the flood. So we can remember to divide Genesis in our head. Genesis 1 through chapter 11, that is the Tower of Babel, is going to be a what we call prehistory, right? And once you pass chapter 11 with Nimrod and Babel, when Nimrod, which is the prototype of um, an, an Antichrist, right? Um, bringing all together to build against God, which we'll get into the next session. After that, you start having Genesis 12, the call of Abram. From then on, the book is about the patriarchs of the of Israel, of the Jewish religion. And so you end 713 years later, interesting enough, the last scenes are the death of Israel, Jacob, and the death of Joseph, the suffering servant. Prophetically, um, it aligns very much with Israel's rejection, right? Joseph, the suffering servant, crying at the threshing floor. If you're more interested in that, go watch the Ruth videos. Um, and the suffering servant dying. Jesus would come first as Mashiach Yosef, the suffering servant. And the second time he came back, he would come Mashiach David, the um, Messiah David, right? To sit on the throne of David, the king. So, um, which is part of the reason why the, the Jews rejected Jesus is that they were looking for both of those 
Joseph and David in one Messiah, not realizing all of these prophecies were absolutely true, but they would happen two times. Um, he even goes down to that when he gets into Elijah and they say, I thought Elijah was supposed to come first because of the Malachi prophecy. And Jesus says in the New Testament, um, yes. And he will come and he has come. Very odd verbiage that he says there because um, he says this, um, Elijah, the spirit of Elijah came upon John the Baptist. That was the first time. The second time is Revelation 11 um, when Elijah and Moses will be the two witnesses. So now that we did that bunny trail, right? <laughs> um, Noah is around 600 years at the time of the flood. We're looking at 1656 after the fall or creation. Let's hit really quickly on if this was a local or globalized flood. Um, I know that people way smarter than me with PhDs um, have great opinions on this being a um, localized flood um, in the Mesopotamian, that it filled up the plain of the Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crest, where civilization was first supposed to begin, and that it was a localized flood. Um, I'm going to say there are massive problems with believing that. Um, and the, the, the base level of it is then you've got a problem because God promised not the Jews, but all of humanity. The Noahic covenant is made with all of humanity plus creation together. When he gives the covenant um, to Noah and the promises, he says in um, Genesis 9, that um, he will give the bow, remember the rainbow, as a sign that he will not do this again to all of the earth. But there are localized floods all of the time. And so if this was localized and God said he won't do this again, then God is not a God of truth. So I I'm going to tell you that's the number one problem um, with saying it's localized, but there's actually tons. Why did Noah need to bring birds, for instance? Um, why did he need Need to put animals on there. Um, animals could just gone somewhere else or they would have survived somewhere else. Um, why is there evidence, I'm going to call it flood geology, all over this earth? Why is there a flood story in almost every ancient civilization that we find has a massive earth flood story? How do you explain the Grand Canyon? Do you really believe, I believe it's the Missouri River, um, broke that down? Um, over time, but I don't. The flood clearly came from underneath the earth and above pouring down. When you read this, it clearly says it. From underneath, um, it let out and then from above. Realize that this is a undoing almost of day three of creation. Remember what we talked about on day three. Um, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so God called earth land dry and the waters um, were gathered together and he called it seas and God saw that it was good. Realize that when he does this and the deluge comes from underneath the earth and above, that he's reversing day three. He floods it again. And I'm going to tell you that um, Peter tells us in 1 Peter, um, he explains that he baptizes the earth again because of the wickedness all over it. That the flood was a picture of baptism. That when we get baptized, we go through the waters of death. Realize that those waters were filled with the dead. Only eight of everything all people, sorry, got on, and then seven clean animals, pairs of seen, clean animals, and seven pairs of unclean animals got on the ark. And that's in 7-2, um, um, Genesis 7-2. So you see that there were waters of death, and yet the ark brought them through. And it's the same when our baptism waters. We go under, and our fleshly, our son of Adam goes under, and we come out of the baptism waters, heirs, sons of God. It is a physical representation of this spiritual thing that happens to us when we come under the blood of Jesus Christ. So um, 
we I'm gonna just flat out say I do not believe it's localized um, I believe that there's a global flood one more reason um, I've listened to several scholars that say well it's localized because often the Bible for and they give the example of um, Genesis in Genesis for instance when Joseph says that all of the earth went through a famine and they came to Egypt well if you actually see later on the Bible when the Bible does that the Bible will clarify later on for instance in um, here it says gather all the animals well then it clarifies actually well seven pairs of clean animals seven pairs of unclean animals seven pairs of birds it actually has a um, cl it clarifies it there's a word for this and I'm losing it in my head um, apologize it's gonna come to me it's gonna come to me um, so then you see a nomenclature, nomenclature, nomenclature. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so, um, with Joseph, he says all of the earth was in a famine and came to Egypt. Well, then later on, he actually clarifies what that meant. He says it's Egypt as a whole. And then he clarifies the outside, um, countries that came in. Well, with the flood, there is nothing that clarifies it, right? You don't get that. He doesn't later come back and say, actually, um, I flooded the earth, but it was actually Mesopotamia, right? Um, I also heard a professor say same thing with Paul. He will say the gospel, I will carry the gospel to all of the world. Well, he's saying, well, actually he brought it to all of Rome, which was the world for Paul. But you have to understand the Holy Spirit is writing that and the Holy Spirit will bring the gospel to all of the world. So I don't believe bottom line that this is um um localized another reason is what i read you about jesus saying it's going to be like the days of noah you see we're not going to have partial judgment on this earth this entire earth as paul writes as peter writes will be judged in fire um it's not going to be just some of it the thing is going to burn up. That's why new creation is coming. And so um, I don't think, so because this is prophecy, this is not a, um, yeah, so um, this is 1 Corinthians where Paul's writing just to give you an idea. He's saying no one can lay a foundation. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will be manifest for the day because it will be revealed by fire. And he goes on, let's jump down here. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a, war, a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, not only through the fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple? And it goes on to talk about this, but it's talking about that the end comes through fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were in weir, the fire. It was the fires that put, produced them as gold. It was the fires that burned off the ropes that tied them, um, prophesying the disbelief of the Jews. So we see this over and over, um, but it is not going to be partial. It will be the entire world. And so I'm going to tell you, I believe that the flood is the entire world. And that um, that's important to understand what is coming. Okay, that this is all patterns. I'm trying to get to Peter. Come on, Peter. Um, first Peter, just so you know, for that reference, um, tells us about baptism and the and Noah and the ark um, in First Peter three, and kind of read eighteen through twenty two to give you baptism, which corresponds to this. Now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ. And he talks about Noah while the ark being prepared, in which few eight persons were brought safely through the water. So you can go look that up. Um, okay. So that's our before, um, our beforehand. So let's go and do some paralleling now quickly of the arc and, doo -doo -doo. okay, making sure I still have no time. All right, I'm going to stand up here so I can write, let me move my chair out of the way. Okay, um, let's parallel these things together and go through them. The arc... Um, we're going to do the ark, um, as prophecy. Okay. Because we're always looking. So we're going to do the ark prophecy right now. So, um, I've laid out a couple of them. One is, um, we talked about 120 years, right? 
the, the 120 years is not referring to just um, man. But when you read it, it says, it talks about how bad mankind has become. And it says, and the Lord said, my spirit will not dwell a man forever. 120 years is what they have. For 120 years, Noah preached to the people. Noah is a prophet, okay? Noah is the prophet before judgment. So that 120 years is what we talked about. But the problem is that mankind, right, lived longer. This is the amount of time before the flood is coming, before judgment. God always, always, always sends a prophet before judgment comes. Um, Jeremiah came to Israel before Israel would be taken over by the Babylonians. Jonah went to Nineveh before um, Nineveh would be, t would be crushed. Um, John came to Israel before Jesus came. Elijah and Moses in Revelation 11 will come before um, the tribulation period or during the tribulation period, before the end, I should say. So these 120 years, um, when, and when you read that in your Bible, realize that's how long Noah preached, okay, to people while he was building the ark. Um, so this is prophetic because this is how he always works. God always sends prophets to say, I'm coming. You need to repent before it comes. Um, two, I'm going to tell you that the ark, um, let's see, has one door, okay, and one window. Okay, let's hit on these real fast. You find this in 6, uh, 14. So make yourself an arc of gopher word. Make it in room. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. That's the, the wrong one. Where is the window? Make a roof. The window is in 6, 16. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark inside of it. So this is 6, 16. I'm going to give you the reference point here. One a couple things about this. The word window here is um, not the right word window. When it's used again, when the, when he sends the um, dove and the raven out of the window, it's right. Okay, when it's used the second time. But here it actually means noon, meaning it's set in the roof as a hatch to look up. When you see the really cute little. Um, arc pictures we show little kids with all the windows it's wrong one is would you want to watch the utter devastation that is coming on from the ark your family members and and we must remember this noah had family members that were not on that ark first cousins um brothers like realize it says they had other brothers and sisters noah was 600 years old we know that three sons, that he had three sons that got, we don't know the whole story. We're told what we need to know. So I think it's interesting. The, there is one door. Jesus says in John 10, 19, I am the door, right? Remember, there are seven I am messages in the book of John. And he says, I am the door. The ark is literally showing you there is one way in. If you believe that you can call God by another name, if you can call him by Allah or if any of the gods of the Hindu religion or even um, the Mormon God or the Jehovah Witness God, I have to tell you that is not Jesus. Okay, there is one door. He also says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's only one way in. The other thing about this window is it's facing up and it's at noon. The light comes in through that hatch. This is the perfect representation of how we are to live this life. Looking up to the Father who shines the light upon us, which is Jesus Christ that was on the day one of time. The light, right, separated the darkness. This is the window into us, our souls, right, that he fills us with light. But I also think it was about all Noah could see was up. When all of the destruction was coming, all Noah could see was God. He did not see the death that was dis dis was all around him. So you get this example, which I think is strong prophecy. Third, um, it's made of, and we just read this, wood, gopher wood, and pitch. These are two things I think are prophetic. Um, this is... 
right here, make rooms. This is in verse 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Wood, the cross. This ark, like the cross, both will be wood that brings us through to life. It will be upon the cross that Jesus hangs to see us through the seas, to see us through to life just as the wood. But this word pitch is even more interesting to me because the word pitch that's used um, here in 14, make rooms in the ark, which people have always compared. And I love that. But God says, I'm going to make a room for you in my house. Um, cover it inside and out with pitch. Okay. This word for pitch is kofer. But it's never used for pitch other than this moment. It is always um, used as its base name, which is kafer, okay, with an A. And over 70 times in the Bible, it is used, but it always means atonement. And interesting enough, the Bible tells us something super important about it. He says, cover it inside and outside with pitch. Well, usually when you make a boat, you cover the outside. It preserves the wood. It preserves through the waters of death to the other side so that it doesn't erode, so that it doesn't take it down. But God is telling Noah here, do it inside and out. This is the perfect picture. When you realize the word kofer, which is used for pitch, is atonement. He's saying inside and out, you must be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. The cross, right, that brings that is brought by the cross, you must be covered inside and out if you were to be brought through the waters if you were to be preserved until the end to be holy and sanctified to be brought as the offering to the father by the son as the ones that he has saved and kept as he says in john 17. this atonement is so important to us because we must be covered inside and out by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the lamb that was slain, by the covenant that we live in, in order to be preserved for eternal life. I think it's also a fascinating concept that this boat probably is still there. Because you see, wood would probably erode and be gone. But if it's covered inside and out, will it not be interesting to see if one day we find this ark again? Um, will it not be interesting? We've had so many people say they've seen it, but there's been nothing. We haven't seen it. I know they say it's in Turkey, but we don't really know. But it'll be fascinating to see if these things come back. Similar to the Ark of the Covenant, which we know that the Ark and the Ark are two different words. Um, they're not the same. But the Ark of the Covenant was wood, and most of that would have eroded away. Um, but the mercy seat would not have. Remember the mercy seat. To this day, Ethiopians claim they have it. Who knows, right? We don't know where it is. And it'll be fascinating if when the temple's rebuilt, if these things come back and get revealed. But um, the mercy seat is, is, I believe, important because of the end of the millennial reign. Will it not be fascinating if that mercy seat is used again, if Jesus himself puts it back on the throne? Because remember, when he is risen, and the two women come to the tomb. There's an angel sitting at his head and his feet. Do you see the picture? It's the Ark of the Covenant again. His, the place where his body lay, where he laid down to die for us, is the mercy seat of God. Because it is through that that his mercy came, through the death of his son. So these are some ways that it parallels. There are more. Um, I just love this about the atonement in and out. Um, so the ark becomes a physical picture of what it means to be in Jesus Christ during judgment or life on the seas. The other thing that are interesting is who closed the door, okay? It says in verse 7, I mean chapter 7, 1, Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, seven pairs of the birds. Um, fast forward, fast forward. And Noah did all that the Lord said. And he was 600 years old um, when he went in. And then, uh, da, 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 da. 
to man and God commanded Noah and after seven days the waters of the flood came so they go in and it is God himself who closes the door okay um, I think this is a beautiful picture of that it is God himself that, that keeps us safe in him but I want to tell you even further I think that they're in there let me put it over here seven days before the flood comes. This is a great picture of the tribulation years. Seven days they're inside. They are, they are safe from whatever's happening, but they have to trust. Where are they during the seven days when everyone else is outside realizing judgment is about to be here? They're inside. They're safe. God closed the door and kept them in. So I think this is prophetic, very prophetic of the end tribulation time when, when he will protect those that are in him. And you see that they're inside the ark, inside the very thing that will save them, that is covered inside and out, the door that God closed himself. All, I've heard it said, all debates about theology ended the moment that door closed because there was no more time. It was time for seven days of um, hardship. I, I can't fathom what it was like for the people and that were outside realizing I've missed the boat, literally. And then the waters come upon the earth. We know at the end, the seven, at the end of the seven years of tribulation, it will be fire that comes when it is totally over. So you see um, that the ark represents that Jesus Christ is our propiti propitiation. I can't say that word. <laughs> Um, of our sins and that um, Jesus literally is the offering for us. The ark sheltered them from judgment. They didn't, all they had was the window to look up to the Lord. Um, the, those outside the ark died in judgment and in wrath, but those inside did not. Seven days point to the seven years of tribulation and the ark points to the coming um, of Christ. So, I know I'm skipping a lot. Y'all, there's so much in here, but I'm going to just kind of uh, make it faster and wrap it up with this, um, with the arc. Um, yeah, I hate to skip so much, but there's so much to do. <laughs> go, go do a lot of research on this. Um, we're going to jump to where it rests, okay? So here we have all of these ways that the ark is a parallel prophecy, if you will, of Jesus Christ and even the end times of those that are in Jesus Christ. But also I want you to see, to go with me to chapter 8, when the flood starts subsiding. Um, at the end of 150 days, this is um, verse 3, 8, 3. The waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ariat. Let's just quickly say, um, let's just quickly go over this. Um, because I'm running out of time. There are two calendars for the Jews. And you have to understand that the calendar changed in Exodus and that the Jews now have names like Tishri and Nisan, right, for their um, calendar months. But they did not have those until the captivity of Babylon. That's where they got the names. God gave numbers to the calendar. They got names, like we have January and February, from captivity in Babylon. But that this day, if you line the two calendars up, remember the calendar switched, okay? Um, and I'm not going to go into that. Please, if you're interested in the calendars, go do your research. It's fascinating. But when you do the seventh month, the 17th day of Nisan, right? Because of the how the calendars are working. This is the day of first fruits. The, and this is what I'm going to tell you. Um, it came to rest. The ark came to rest. The word for rest is first used in Genesis 2.15 when it says he put the Lord God, took the man that he had built, right, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and keep it. The word put him is rest him. It's the same word that is used. used. It is nuach, okay, N-U-W-A-C-H in Hebrew. Here it came to rest on the day of first fruits on the Mount of Ariat. Ariat means the, um, it, uh, sorry, Ariat means the curse has been reversed. That is the day Jesus Christ will raise from the dead.
You see, God cares about location. God cares about time. All of these things align. This ark rest on the seventh month. If you want to wonder why the Holy Spirit went so specific on when this thing hit a mountain and rested, it's because it is the same day that Jesus Christ will raise from the dead, the Lord of the Sabbath, the one who is our rest and will reverse the curse. This is all prophecy of what is coming. So you see this beautiful picture that God is saying, this ark is representing that I am going to bring eight people a new beginning through the flood. It's for right then because it's protecting the seed of the woman. Through Noah will come the Savior. I'm protecting it all the way through from the beginning of time to the end. But I will do this again when my son, the ark, the, will lay on the wooden cross and will put atonement inside and outside of mankind so that they may rest in me again. It is about bringing us back to the garden. On one little side note, I want you to remember if you were part of the Gentile church, um, that what is in the mouth of the dove when, when he sends out the dove and then seven days, it's always in the numbers of seven, the dove comes, comes back and in his mouth is an olive branch, right? This is chapter eight, 11. And the dove came back to him in the evening and behold, in her mouth was a flesh, freshly plucked olive branch. Right there, I just want to want you to connect these. This is Romans 11. When Paul starts explaining, it's the church in her mouth is the branch that will be grafted into the tree because the church is the olive branch that is brought in. So from this far back, God is saying, I will save my people within but I will also bring in a, there is just as much as there is a remnant for um, Shem's line, right? There is going to be a remnant, as we will see from Japheth's line. There is a remnant of the Gentiles as much as there is a remnant of Israel that I will save. And you see it through Noah. You see it through the branch in the dove's mouth. You see it through the ark resting on the mountain that means the sin, is, the curse is reversed. On the day of first fruits, when Jesus Christ would raise from the grave and he would be the first fruits unto God, the first fruits of those who will be raised, for we will all be raised in him again. So I hope that that kind of covers, I know that was the arc like super fast forward in, <laughs> and I'll try to finish up for you and um, kind of go through Gen what Noah's life looks like after this. And um, maybe the, this next one will be our last lesson, but I have really enjoyed going through Genesis with you. So I'll see you for our final session, session 13.